Yeah, hello everyone. The next 20 minutes will be about data vis accessibility and what we can do to make our data visualizations more inclusive for everyone. A bit of background information about me. I'm Sarah Fossheim. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an independent accessibility specialist, um, also with a background in front-end development and UX design, currently located in Oslo, but soon moving myself and my business to the very north of Norway, to Varanger. And to start the con conversation about data vis accessibility, I'd like to show you what the state of it is these days with an example of a chart that I found related to the upcoming US presidential elections, where a news outlet ran thousands of predictions to uh, check whether Kamala Harris or Donald Trump would win, and then visualize those in a scatter plot. And the demo I'm going to show is me using this with a screen reader and checking what the experience is like. And it's very similar to how a lot of graphs sound like when I test them. In our simulations of the 2024 presidential election, Trump wins 44 times out of 100. There is a less than 1 in 100 chance of no electoral college winner. Fibby calculator PNG, image, Harris, 555, Trump, 441, no winner, plus, 4, 1000, simulations, Harris win, Trump wins, 1 simulated electoral college outcome, image, 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 <laughs> no winner, image, image. <laughs> so I'll stop it at that, but for those who didn't hear it because the sound isn't working, the screen reader read every single point on the chart, so a thousand points, image, 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 image. And that's, of course, because the developers tried to turn those elements into something usable for screen readers, turned them into images, but forgot to add the alt text. Or maybe they tried to add the alt text, but there was a bug in the code, so it didn't come through on the actual live version. And it gets this way because of the code, and it's very easy for us in the field, both as accessibility testers or as developers, PMs, designers, to just all blame this on the developer who wrote this one component or this one chart and be like, hey, you didn't add your alt text, what kind of a stupid developer are you, kind of. But what to keep in mind is that this isn't a code issue or it isn't a developer issue. When I see something like this, I also ask myself, did the designers do some research about what a chart like this should be like, what the experience should be like for a blind person? And that they communicate this and document this for the developers who will be actually implementing this into code. The testers catch this. Did th this even get tested with a screen reader? What's the process if the tester found this issue and said, hey, all those points are, co are announced as an image? Did someone follow up on that? How do those fixes get prioritized? Get, does time get set aside throughout the process to plan for accessibility, to have this conversation? And also is this part of our school system, our education system, when we go to conferences and we learn on how, what we can do to make our code better, is there any conversation about accessibility there? Is there any training budget when people want to go to conferences or go to training to improve their web development, data vis, accessibility, data vis skills? Is does, do companies actually prioritize accessibility in that training budget? Will you be able to get a promotion if you choose to go for accessibility training rather than for performance training courses? And were people even aware that this type of bug can happen? To me, accessibility is much more of a culture and process issue than a specific code issue, design issue, planning issue. It affects everyone that touches your products um, in, in the process. So it's also important that like, if you're sitting here as a PM or you're sitting here as a designer or a developer or a tester or as a CEO, like, there is going to be something in the world of accessibility you will have to do in order to make your product more inclusive. And when we talk about accessibility, I do want to recap a bit what it is we're talking about. And mostly when we talk about accessibility these days, we talk about web accessibility. And especially with companies who have offices in the EU, the past half a year, the past year, the conversation has been a lot around the European Accessibility Act and a very 
dreading deadline of June 2025. And this is important for a lot of EU companies because it's a law that says that all products have to be accessible for people with disabilities. <coughs> and if not, people can actually file complaints and sue the company for not being inclusive. And of course, here in Norway, we already had laws like this from before. In fact, when clients approach me and say, hey, do you want to work with us on accessibility? One of their first things they ask is, do we have to comply to the Norwegian law system and can you avoid us getting sued over this? And what the Norwegian laws say is that the private sector has to be compliant with WUKAG uh, 2.0, uh, A and AA compliance, and uh, the public sector has some additional requirements about what you disclose on your website and also has a newer version of WUKAG to comply to. I'm not going to go that much into compliance these days, but I do want people to be aware of it that when you are building a product, it is actually important to think of accessibility for more than just the users, you can get in trouble yourself as well. <laughs> and in this, I keep referring to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WUKAG, which is also something that if you start looking up accessibility online, you're going to come across this document a lot. And this might look quite intimidating to you, and it definitely looked intimidating to me the first time I wanted to get into accessibility work, and I opened this document, and I was just presented with text upon text upon text. <laughs> Uh, so what's important for you to know here is that this has principles, which is things like that your content should be perceivable, it should be operable, it should be understandable to everyone, and the code you write should be robust. Then you can find more information about specific guidelines that you should adhere to, and then the actual success criteria are testable criteria that you can check, does my website include those things? And something fun there as well is that there's a two small links that are very easy to miss, understanding and how to meet. Those four developers and designers that are implementing the work, there's a lot of information there on what kind of techniques you can use in order to make sure that, for example, an image is announced to people using screen readers. So when we talk about accessibility, we're often talking about alt text and about sufficient contrast or about using HTML elements. So those are very specific things. But there's one important thing that I want us to talk about as well before we continue to data this, which is that accessibility is not just about technical specs. It's not just about testing or getting audits done or about reaching compliance or about doing work to avoid getting fined. It's very much about including people and more specifically about including disabled people. My screen stopped working. There we go. And in Norway, almost 400,000 people are on NAV Uføretrygg, so on uh, support from NAV because they are disabled. Worldwide, around 15 to 25% of the population has reported to have a disability. The 15% is if you check the World Health Organization data, the 25% is based on self-reported disabilities, which is around a million people in Norway, around a fifth of the population. So it's a quarter of the population or a million people in Norway that are being excluded or facing barriers on the majority of websites and the majority of data visualizations. In 2022, 2020, WebAIM did a um, survey to check the accessibility of the web, uh, tested a million websites, the million most popular ones, and found that 98% of them have accessibility errors. And it was around 60 errors per page or something. This has improved <laughs> to this year. <laughs> Only 96% of websites have accessibility issues, so we are making some progress there. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we include all of this into DataVis? Are there any people here who have worked with data visualizations before, like implemented a chart? Yeah, quite a bit. All of you are actually accessibility designers, accessibility developers in a way. Because to me, DataVis, it's a way of implementing accessibility. We create visualizations to make the underlying data more accessible. If I show this table with um, stores of uh, Walmart in the US and locations of them, it's uh, 5,282 rows with every location of Walmart added. If I ask you, in which state are most Walmart stores located, you're probably going to have a hard time figuring it out from this data table 
because you're going to have to look at 25 rows at a time for 5,000 rows total. <laughs> but if I instead put this in a graph, now while I'm talking, some of you have probably already gotten the answer in your head. Most of the Walmart stores in the US are located on the East Coast. And more specifically, there's higher concentrations of them around larger cities. And I know that because of the amount of data points that are on this chart, I can see locations where there are more of them gathered. I also know that the size of them relates to the amount of stores in a city. So the larger the hexagon, the more stores. Also the coordinates, this is maybe something that happens a bit more subconsciously, but I can, for example, locate LA and Dallas, Texas based on the X and Y coordinates of that dot on the chart, and I can kind of recognize this and this is how I get to the information. And additionally, there's also color here. The more red a dot is, the older the median age of the stores in this area, and the more green or blue it is, the younger the median age of the stores. So I can also tell m that Walmart started somewhere in the south of the US. I can even find the specific area or the specific city, which is in Arkansas. And I can see that because the color gradually gets more orange and blue, that the Walmart stores gradually started. They started in one location, and then in a radius, they spread themselves throughout the US. And that's a lot of visual information and a lot of properties and a lot of things that have to be combined to tell us this insights that are both high level summaries. On the East Coast, there's more Walmarts, but at the same time, also can provide me very detailed information about um, uh, Walmart was started in Arkansas and then it gradually expanded throughout the south and then went to the east coast and then to the west coast. In order to make those more inclusive, we're going to have to think of several things. And one of them is we start by the visual. We're talking about data visualizations. It's a very visual practice. We have those colors, we have those shapes, we have those sizes. And we will have to make sure that those colors have enough contrast. Color contrast, you may have heard about it in the text sense, that interface colors and text colors need to have enough contrast with their backgrounds. In WCAG, it says text has to be 4.5 over 1 contrast. That's to make sure that everyone can read this. Here on this text, I have a lot of contrast. So even if the lightning here was bad and, uh, or the screen was bad, if you were in the back of the room, you would be able to read this as well. If I went for very light contrasts, you would probably maybe struggle a bit more as well. So ensuring enough contrast is not just for uh, people with low vision to be able to understand your graphs. It also helps for people who are joining from uh, devices with bad screens or joining from bad light conditions or, yeah. And for charts specifically, the uh, color contrast is three over one and I will soon show you how you can test for this yourself. Graphical objects, so for example, bars on a bar chart, they need to have three over one contrast with their backgrounds. So in this case, this black dot has an 11.78 over one contrast with the background. But it also needs to have this contrast with adjacent elements. So in this case, the blue and the green, they do not have enough contrast. They only have 2.5 2 over one. And the reason that this is important is because, for example, on a pie chart like this, if I am low vision and um, I cannot understand the contrast or see the contrast between both shapes, I cannot see the data and I cannot see that one quarter of this pie chart is dark blue and that three quarters are another meaning. I can just see one color. So the more data points we add, the more we're going to have to start testing. In this case, with two colors, I will need to check is the blue having enough contrast against the green? Is the green having enough contrast against the yellow background? And is the blue having enough contrast against the yellow background? Just adding one color means that I suddenly have to test six different colors. Is pink having enough contrast against blue? Is pink having enough contrast against green? Green against blue? And then all three of them against the background. So the more and more colors you add to your chart, the more and more colors you're going to have to compare to each other and find the balance between. And this is one of those areas where I feel like it's really adventurous to start early in the process thinking about accessibility. Because if you think about it, if you have a chart with like five different colors and you already have to do a lot of color adjustments, if you 
push this to production and everyone is using and using this chart and the colors have been used throughout other charts. If not two years from now, you have to come back to this and start fixing this. Suddenly you're going to have to go back to colors that you as developers and designers, your users, your investors, branding, all have gotten used to and you're going to have to start making small tweaks to those or even going for completely different colors. And it's going to be quite a bit of work to like collect all the different shades of red you have throughout your project, all the different shades of orange you have uh, throughout your project and try to align them in a way. Whereas if you do this at once, as soon as in the design process, the designer sees that one color no longer has enough contrast against the rest, it might be only a five minute job to just slightly adjust the brightness of one of the colors and make it work. And what we can do for this is there are very handy tools for designers. If you're using Figma or uh, Sketch, there are plugins like uh, Stark or Able that you can use. For example, Able is one that I use a lot. You select two colors or two shapes that have a color in your Figma artboard, and the plugin is going to tell you the contrast ratio and whether this meets uh, WCAG large text, small text, or uh, graphical shapes requirement. Similarly, if you are a developer or a tester or in any way you don't have Figma and you just want to quickly check how your website is doing, there are automated tests like uh, X, which is made by the Q, which is an automated accessibility tester. That one will pick up on color issues. And same, for example, if you're using Chrome, in the, access in the Lighthouse accessibility report, it will also pick up on color contrast issues. And for DataVis specifically, there's the DataVis contrast tool, which is recently made uh, by someone from Shipste. I think there's quite a bit of thin people here as well. Um, this one, following this, it's not necessarily going to make you WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 compliant because it's based on uh, a different algorithm of calculating color contrast that's supported in WCAG 3.0. So when you are trying to make your graph compliant to the law, you will have to do some extra checks for the um, uh, for the WCAG 2.0 compliance, but what this thing does is it checks if colors have enough contrast and also takes the thickness of your lines into account because it's in line on a chart will need more contrast than a big ass circle in the middle of a page. Related to color, and this is not something I'm going to talk a lot about, we have to also make sure that our color palettes are color blind friendly. And the reason I'm not talking much about this is because when it comes to data viz accessibility, I feel like it's one of the main and only things that have been out there information-wise for a very long time. When I got into data viz accessibility in 2017, and I googled how to make my charts accessible, the only thing that came up was don't use green and red as your color palette. <laughs> so yeah, don't use green and red, <laughs> and what can help you with this uh, is, for example, the colorblind plugin for Figma, uh, which, when you use the plugin, it will take your artboard, copy it uh, eight times, and for different types of and gen generate different types of color blindness. So show that for someone who has full color blindness on the bottom right, there's uh, just black and white version. For someone who cannot see green or who cannot see red or who cannot see blue, it will look differently. And again, if you do this while you're designing a chart or while you're designing a website, it becomes easier and easier to adjust the colors while you're doing it compared to going back to your chart again months later. And if you want to test this in a website that's already live, you don't have to start picking those colors and recreating them in Figma. You can open, for example, Firefox Accessibility Tools, which has a little simulate button that simulates whichever web page you're on for different types of color blindness again. What did you say? Chrome has it too. Okay, great. Haven't discovered it yet. <laughs> um, also related to color is to not just rely on color. So this can be, for example, adding patterns or shapes to give meaning to data, and not just green and red. But before, bec for example, a green circle means positive, a red square means negative. Then there's also the circle and the square as different. And alternative formats, this can mean different things. This helps both when it comes to color contrast or when it comes to the way you will perceive elements and also to make things more understandable for everyone. For example, here, the charts um, that show the, um, 
generations of uh, or the simulations of whether Biden or Trump was going to win in 2020. Uh, there were also like lots of data points on the scatter plot, but the data was available there in text format. Biden is favored to win the election. It was there in number formats, 89 out of 100 simulations Biden won. And it was there in like a very visual format, a lot of dots next to Biden's face and very few dots next to Trump's face. So the data itself is explained in different levels of complexity and with different ways. Someone who doesn't speak English will maybe be able to understand what this is about by seeing that there's a big face of Biden with a lot of dots next to his face. If you uh, find it, um, for example, difficult to uh, understand the numbers, you can still read the actual text, Biden is favored to win the elections. If you are a more visual person who wants to see things in a 2D, 3D space, then all the dots will give you the information as well. Like there's a lot of different ways of accessing this. And similarly, there's the red and the blue, which is very well known as Republican and Democrat colors. It's also explained in a legend and explained with text on top of the dots and a picture on top of the dots. So both the explanation of the color and the data is in this chart visualized in many different ways. And a bit more detached of that is using tables as a backup to visualizations. We did say we want to add visualizations to make data more understandable and to summarize big sets of data in a way that we can maybe at glance get insights from it. But data, does give, t data tables do give a very detailed and objective view into the data. If I want to know, for example, in the chart we saw earlier of the US, how many stores there are, uh, or a big cluster of stores, which location is this? For me, who's from outside the US, I would have to Google a map of the US at the same time to compare uh, wh which different cities are on which different places. Whereas in a table format, I would be able to say, OK, now take me to the biggest dots. OK, that's in Los Angeles, California, and know the location. And now we get to the fun part, which is making sure that everyone, including blind people using the page for the screen reader, can get access to the data. For those who don't know screen readers, they base themselves on the information that's available on the DOM. A screen reader is a piece of assistive technology, and the only way it will know what to actually announce is if we as developers give them that information. Typically, this is based on, for example, um, if you have a button, then those elements will let the screen reader know, hey, this is a button. And the screen reader, in this case, I'm using VoiceOver, will even tell the screen reader user automatically in their own system language, this is a button, and in order to click it, these are the specific screen reader controls that you can use. This is not something you as a developer have to think about. As long as you use the button element, the screen reader user will be able to click the button and will be told in every way possible that this is a button. Similarly, if we use the H1, H2, H3 heading tags, those give structure to our page, also for screen reader users who can pull up this very useful heading menu and get an overview of the page and the content of the page, similar to how we might visually scan a page for headlines. And then they can choose one of those headlines and automatically navigate to that part of the page. Now, when it comes to DataVis, for those who have created data visualizations, SVG elements, they don't carry much semantic meaning. They're just, as you see there, for example, a path that has been given a fill and a lot of coordinates. A screen reader, first of all, does not know how to enter how to access those elements, but it will also not know what to actually tell the user. Like it cannot tell the user, here are the coordinates of the shape. It needs to do something with it. And that's again where we as developers come into play. And one option is to turn the entire vis into an image with alt text, to put a role image and an area label with the description of what's visible in the image on just the top of the SVG. Then the entire chart will be an image. And in this case, a screen reader will say, this is an image, 53% of orders included drinks and ice cream, 47% of orders were for ice cream only. And this is again something where automated tests can check whether or not the image roles have an alt text associated with it, but they cannot test the quality. If I, for example, post a picture and I ask, is this a photograph? Is this a bird? Is it a European herring gull? Or is it an adult herring gull looking straight at the camera with a stern look on her face? Uh, 
automated test will be able to check that this alt text is there, but it will not be able to tell me if this alt text is useful for the user. That's again something where like developers and designers and testers will have to collaborate. Another option is what the graph in the start of the presentation started doing, and it's to make those individual data points <coughs> into elements that are accessible by a screen reader. So for example, a list or a table is something that has semantic meaning and that can also be used as a tool of grouping elements or sorting elements or communicating this type of information. NVDA, line 106 with six data points. This is the most used screen reader in 2019, region 1. December 2010, 34.8%. NVDA, image 2. May 2012, 43%. NVDA, image 3. January 2014, 51.2%. NVDA, image. So this is a chart made with uh, high charts, which is a Norwegian company that makes more that makes uh, data visualization libraries, and those also have uh, really good accessibility support options. So in this case, the screen reader has uh, understood that this entire line is one category of data, has some high-level information about it, and then the user can choose to go into detail through all of those steps. This is again something that will require manual testing, accessibility reviews, user tests. This is a place where it's very good to get a user in front of your chart and get them to interact with it. And again, tables, they're always a really good alternative to have, even if you do all of those other steps. Because first of all, they gave this objective uh, view into the data, but they also are very recognizable. A screen reader user, whichever table they land on, wherever on the web, if it's coded as a table, they will have the same controls to navigate vertically and horizontally and get all the information. Then this should not be um, confused with keyboard accessibility because screen reader users do use keyboards, but they also have their own commands. I'm not going to talk that much about keyboard accessibility, but what we need to know there is that designers can help a lot documenting this. If, for example, you want your chart to be filterable and people to be able to navigate through each and every single data point and then click on them with their space or enter bar, you will still need to tell the developers what kind of sorting of the data makes sense or what kind of grouping you would want people to navigate this through. And similar, again, when you test this, an automated check can't really tell you if this makes sense. This is something you yourself or with an accessibility tester or with users have to verify. And there's a whole lot more to think about. I would keep talking about this for five more hours <laughs> if I was allowed. <laughs> um, but my final tip is to not get too focused on the vis part in DataVis. It's very easy to talk about, oh, we're making data visualizations. It's a visual practice. Now we have this bar chart or we have this, ta uh, this um, map with all those data points. How are we going to translate this back into a screen reader experience? Instead, I want us to also focus on the data itself because the visualization is just a way of communicating the data. So this, isn't, this is like a map about the locations and opening years of Walmart. It's not a map with hexagons of variable sizes and colors. That's just the way we chose to visualize this data. So I want us to think about what are we trying to communicate? What type of values does our data have or what kind of units is it? What kind of trends do we want the user to look for? How will people interact with this and in which context? And that makes us realize that accessibility is about much more than just compliance. It's about designing an experience and it's about designing an inclusive experience. And in order to reach that, it needs to be part of the entire process. What I often see is whatever the development process is, like research, design, prototype, develop, test, or any variation of that, people do this. Then they wait a while and they're like, hey, we maybe have to think about accessibility. And sometimes this is at once, very often. <laughs> this is many years later. <laughs> uh, but the issue is that the longer you wait saying, hey, let's make our shit accessible, the harder it's going to be and the more expensive it's going to be because the more accessibility will be ingrained in your company habits, your company culture. If you're not used to testing, it's very hard to get started. And it's what makes accessibility a really big and expensive job. So instead, I want everyone to think, hey, let's make this accessible. And how can we let this influence our process? Like, what do we have to think about when researching our users? What do we have to design for? What do we have to document when handing this over to the developers? What do we want to include in user tests? 
what can developers test themselves, what can designers test themselves, for what do we need external help, for what do we need internal help. And when we do all of that, then accessibility is a really good tool for making us think. We have to think about the content when making data is accessible. We have to think about the structure of our graphs. And we have to think about the functionality of it and how people will interact. And that's how prioritizing accessibility will lead to better visualizations. But we also need to remember we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. And if there's any questions, I'll be either available in the break or on Mastodon or my website. Thank you.